All right, let's get started with and uh, so as we get the day started with, let me begin our discussions on one principal question that I had given to you as a homework yesterday. What exactly is the difference between literary criticism and literary theory? Yes, Dharmaji. Yes, sir. Uh, literary criticism is something which was done by the past, uh, the past poets and authors. Uh, for instance, literary criticism, the uh, debate on poetry was uh, first began by Plato and then came uh, by Aristotle. For us and uh, Lenginius and uh, then we move on to British literature, uh, Philip Sidney, P.V. Sally, William Wordsworth, uh, John Dryden, etc. Uh, these critics uh, uh, were making the art of writing a lot uh, better by giving suggestions on how to write a poetry or how to write a work. And uh, they implemented uh, the uh, same things which they have said about in their own uh, uh, own, uh, own concepts uh, refers uh, to lyrical ballads so we see uh, um, by, uh, refers to lyrical ballads uh, by Wordsworth and uh, uh, Samuel Taylor or uh, Goldridge uh, whatever uh, he said uh, he preached in uh, all his poems uh, on the other hand we have literary theory which uh, is done by modern People. It all began with uh, the structuralism and uh, then came the past, uh, sorry, post uh, structuralism. Uh, you can say that uh, literary criticism gave birth uh, to theories. Literary, uh, literary criticism is the practical application, whereas theory is just a, as an idea whenever we study literary uh, theory. We are studying the ideas like Marxism, feminism, and using the ideas, we were we uh, we are doing literary criticism of a work. Literary criticism is practical. For instance, um, to pick a, a book, uh, when we uh, pick a book and uh, keep uh, reading and reading, uh, reading uh, for many weeks, months, and uh, years, and for uh, for many decades, and finally one day we will uh, come to um, uh, come sorry come with some theory we will understand uh, there is some idea but um, uh, but uh, is prevalent along on the novels uh, that has ever been written by the mankind and uh, become a founder of a new theory just like uh, we have marxism feminism post colonialism uh, uh, psychoanalytical criticism so on and uh, um, so forth Okay. Thank you, Gargi. Thank you, Gargi. That is, I mean, that's quite an elaborate definition. But in very, very, very few words, maybe two to three sentences, would anyone else? I, I think I can see Arpita and Yukta have raised their hands. So, would you, would you very briefly like to dis distinguish between these two? Say to Lakshmi, I can see your hands raised. Sir, may I tell the answer? Did you ask me to? Yeah, I saw your hands are raised, so you may please feel free to. Literary criticism is a political literary theory is an art. Sorry, I didn't get you. Literary criticism is a political literary theory is an art. Okay, what do you mean by that? Literary I didn't get you. I'm sorry. Literary criticism has nothing to do with politics. It is literary theory is an art. Okay, okay. You said apolitical. All right, all right. I, I heard it the other way around. I heard literary criticism is political and... Okay, okay. I got it, I got it. All right. That's that's a deeper one. All right. Um, Bhavnaji, I think I saw your hands raised as well. Yes, sir. Good evening. Yes, good evening. Uh, so literary theory is basically, you know, like uh, uh, theory provides us the basic rules and regulations, we can say, uh, I mean, like in a very simple language, it gives us a proper process, right? Uh, it is basically um, laying down of principles. And if I talk about criticism, criticism is basically asking the whys, right? When you're criticizing something or you're, you're critically uh examining something, you ask why, and then you get the answer to it. 
so that is basically mm -hmm. criticism you can say it's a it's a practical application of the theory as we do it in maths we have theorems right and on based on that we actually solve the questions okay yeah Fine. good one good good observation uh yukta ji i can see your hands raised as well uh, yes sir good evening sir okay. so uh, uh we can say that ki literally theory is nothing but we can call it as a tool or a lens by which we see the literary text or the or anything which is in the literature mm -hmm. whereas the criticism is the practice of analyzing the text for example that what a theory says uh, let's say uh, feminist theory so it uh, the feminist theory's principle says it you will understand or you will analyze a text in terms of uh, gender in terms of uh, disparity between uh, uh, men and women so that principle of that notes you will uh, apply to the text and understand what is actually the text is saying basically the meaning of the text changes all together according to how we look at the text and how we look at the text entirely depend upon the theory which we took uh, like basically like just tarah se hum dekhna chahte hain like post colonial theory for example let's say uh, chinua chebe's things fall apart उसमें हम लोग पोस्ट कॉलोनियल थियोरी भी यूज कर सकते हैं हम उसमें फेमिनिस्ट थियोरी भी यूज कर सकते हैं बट या दिस इज ऑल अबाउट अ थियोरी एंड क्रिटिसिज्म की थ्योरी हमें एक ग्राउंड देता है कि किस पर हमें कोई टेक्स्ट को या दो एक से ज्यादा टेक्स्ट को कंपेयर करना है जैसे मैंने भी बताया पोस्ट कॉलोनियलिज्म थोरी होती है फेमिनिस्ट थियोरी है मार्क्सिस्ट थियोरी है तो वो एक हमारी लिटरेरी टेक्स्ट का रूप बदल देती है लेट्स से कि हम जैसे उसको देखना चाहते हैं टेक्स्ट को वैसे ही हम थ्योरी अडेप्ट कर लेते हैं जैसे हमें क्वेश्चंस में मिलते हैं अपने बीएमए में कि लाइक क्रिटिकली एग्जामिन दिस पर्टिकुलर नोवेल लाइक क्रिटिकली एग्जामिन द रोल ऑफ द वुमेन तो हम वहां पे फेमिनिस्ट थ्योरी अप्लाई करते हैं हम वहां पे फेमिनिस्ट थ्योरी के कुछ प्रिंसिपल्स हैं जो कि मैं अब बोलूंगी तो बहुत डेप्थ में चला जाएगा तो उस प्रिंसिपल्स के बेसिस पे हम उसको जज करने लगते हैं तो दैट इज थ्योरी एंड क्रिटिसिज्म Okay thank you thank you for that for all those wonderful But, sir, actually, answers. Actually I have a question because whenever I, when I researching on it I look, uh, this question pops in my head ki what comes first theory comes first or criticism comes first <laughs> That that is kind of a, a tricky question because it's it's, it's just like it's just like asking uh, murgi pehle aaya tha ki andar to don't ask difficult as that do but then <laughs> it's somewhat similar but I think uh, in terms of chronology or in terms of uh, evolution criticism emerged first and uh, from my understanding theory followed later then of course you may ask me then how did the critics critique that's a different thing i'll come to that in a short while but then talking etymologically it is criticism that started and uh, theory like somebody said i think gargi ji had pointed out a little while late, earlier uh, it is more of a modern postmodern evolution technically um, but then we can definitely uh, think both ways Mm, yes all right so let's keep it as short as that i really didn't want to spend 20 minutes on this debate but because you are also enthusiastic i thought chalo let's see let's hear everybody so to get started with that point of discussion it's a very brief discussion actually i'll just send it uh, spend it uh, spend a minute or two on it not more than that so what is the difference between literary criticism and literary theory criticism in simple words is a practical affair you read a book you read a poem in today's case you watch a movie and you write about it you say where it went wrong what are the things that they could have taken care of or how should they be you know approaching this art or the ideal and non ideal things uh, that are prevalent in today's writings so all this falls under the category of criticism when it comes to theory it is more of a proposition it's more of a theoretical thing uh so most of you may feel like theory comes first and then the practice but then it's not true you can simply approach a work of art or writing uh, and comment on it and if you have a scholastic analysis of the art or the art form then that becomes criticism theory is more of a perspectival glass that's a that's a term that i usually bring in to simpler understanding it is a perspectival glass 
जैसे सोचो इफ यू आर यूजिंग येलो कूलिंग ग्लास वट एवर यू सी वुड बी इन येलो यू यूज अ ब्लू ग्लास देन यू सी एवरीथिंग इन ब्लू यू सी अ ब्लैक ग्लास यू सी एवरीथिंग इन ब्लैक सो इट इज अ परस्पेक्टिवल ग्लास you use feminist literary theory you see certain things from a feminist glance you use marxian theory you look some you look at something from a marxian perspective so it is based on what theory you use you look at something in a selective manner sometimes at a higher level you may blend quite a lot of theories together to arrive at a desired result so theory actually is quintessential as far as a student of literature is concerned i'm not saying that criticism is sent but theory has a paramount significance if you are aware of major theories and if you are able to implement it in the literary readings that you come across then that can give you an enlightened stage that can take you to an elevated platform and that's why you have mg5 in the current scenario in the first year because you get to know all the theories then whatever work you learn you can apply these things into those works if required it's not always necessary that you read every book with a theory again let me give you an example that maybe most of you may not be uh, able to relate to but i have experienced it for instance up until let's say 19 20 years of my life initial years of my life formative years of my life just like you i used to go watch movies i used to go to the theater i used to watch movies get excited clap for it or maybe feel bored sleep and come back i also used to watch movies in tv back then it was doordarshan so i used to watch movies in doordarshan so when i used to watch movies up until 20 21 years old it was basically a movie watching experience maybe based on the content maybe about what i was able to understand and not understand likes and dislikes i used to like it or hate it or feel bored but when i became 2021 Or maybe 19, 2021. I got introduced to this thing called film studies, which is part of literature as well in some colleges. So film studies exposed me to quite a lot of things, including short duration. So you have this theory, and like, okay, this is what you are seeing right now is a mid shot. Instead, if I come this closer and you see only my head, that's a close up. Or if I bring my eyes close to the camera, that's a that's an extreme close up. Or if I go far away and stand, that's a long shot. so there are certain rules like 1 by 2 3 by 4 blah 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 and within the cuts there are certain rules apply so ever since i had that knowledge let's say somewhere between 20 to 23 my movie going experience to a bitter because i cannot simply watch a movie without having these things in my mind so the moment let's say there's a jump cut or there's a drag then i am like oh no this is a violation of that rule what is the start to doing so that cripples or handicaps my smooth movie watching experience so sometimes even when i say this is advisable and this would help you uh, have a perspective of glass in the text that you try to read sometimes it may also cripple you from free flow enjoying reading there may be a lot of learners who would say i love to read because i want to enjoy literature so if you approach text with theories sometimes that may intervene in your aesthetic experience so that's one warning that i would like to give you before we get started with so talking about literary theory theory is a perspectival glass theory is more about having certain suppositions based on certain trends or certain happenings in the area or in the society and uh, these theories may be depended upon to arrive at certain observations and again one thing that we should be aware of is using a particular theory would make us monotonous we take a text and we say there is feminist literary theory being applied in this textbook we are at once not looking at any other theories for a time being we are keeping them apart the same text may have different shades we never think about it for instance if there is a book and we are looking at a marxian approach we are probably overlooking all the other aspects of that book so that's again one thing that we need to regard when we try or when we venture out on a theoretical expedition okay so that said let me get the day started and i told you that i'll be dealing with classical literary criticism today which involves plato aristotle and so on um and again okay let me just spend one more minute on this criticism theory debate 
I have a video for you. Just a minute, not more than that. Don't worry. I'll share the link with you anyways, but then let's spend a minute on this as well. So technically, you could say that at this point where we are, there is hardly any literary criticism that is not informed by theory, right? Because we live in a post-linguistic turn world, post-Foucauldian, Derridean, Marxian world. So by and large, that traditional form of literary criticism where you just stayed on the text as a new critic and maybe challenged the form or talked about the form or had this belief system that text is organic whole, maybe that those are no longer possible. So in my opinion, pure form of literary criticism detached from theory I don't think so it is possible, even though people do claim that they do it, right? And even when they are doing it, when they are reading a text carefully and pointing to the nuances of language, after all, their consciousness and their interpretation is informed by the theoretical understanding of language or the modes of reading. So to sum up, literary theory then is the body of knowledge, ideas. All right, so Dr. Masood Raja is one of the expert postcolonial theorists that you'll find in web. He runs quite a lot of online videos if you want to have a look at. So I've shared the link of this debate on criticism as theory. You may have a look at it and explore it yourself. So that thing is there. So literary criticism is more textual. It is trying to figure out something within the text Whereas theory may also be a societal progress, observations, and so on and so forth. Okay, so let's very quickly move on to uh, the beginnings of literary criticism and theory. Please listen to me carefully for the next five minutes because this is an apparatus that would come along with you in whichever genres that you try to explore. Not only criticism and theory, not only MEG5. This is an apparatus that I have drawn uh, or observed which somewhat comes in handy in all the domains. Well, the moment we speak about the origins of Dash, the Dash could be drama, the Dash could be poetry, the Dash could be uh, short story, novel, criticism and theory. Immediately we can divide that into Dash, Dash, Dash. This is a tree diagram, right? So origins of literary criticism, then you can divide it, or literary criticism, and then you can divide it into two. The two is ancient, modern. Okay, ancient and modern. Again, there is a further division which could have come before or after. That is Eastern and Western. So you have this dichotomy between Eastern, Western, and within that you have ancient, modern, ancient, modern. So the inception of most of the genres dates back to Greece. You speak about the origin of poetry, the origin of drama, and the origin of literary criticism. The first column that would come in is Greek. Then you have Roman, Latin, and in the East, in the Eastern aesthetic part, we have Indian literary criticism. The same could be said of drama and poetry. Yes, when it comes to novels and short stories, there would be differences especially short stories and one act plays, for instance, got popularized in America. So there are difference when it come, differences when it comes to latest art forms. But initially, you speak about most of these things. The ancient inceptions dates back to Greece. If you write origins of poetry, then you go to Greece, Roman, Latin, then England, India, uh, Indian aesthetics and so on. England comes in the modern aesthetic only for us. Okay, so talking about the inception of criticism, it dates back to Greece. So again, if you are drawing a tree, tree diagram, ancient, um, sorry, Eastern, Western, and within Western you have Greek, uh, sorry, again, within Western you have ancient and modern. I hope I'm not confusing, let me just type it down. Uh, literary criticism. You have Eastern versus Western. 
again under both both eastern and western you have ancient versus modern so under western the moment you say ancient give me a second yeah the moment you say ancient you speak about greek roman and latin traditions so this is how we discuss that when it comes to modern literary criticism what matters to us not that there is no other thing but what matters to us is the english literary tradition where we tentatively begin with sir philip sidney and then move on to john dryden samuel taylor coleridge william wordsworth and so on and so forth so today we are going to discuss the inceptional part the the ancient literary theory part so talking about western aesthetics as i have already mentioned there is this three partition of greek roman latin exactly at the opposite we should not forget that there is something called eastern literary tradition under eastern literary tradition we have indian criticism or when it comes to poetry indian poetry when it comes to drama indian drama whatever we attach to the western forms mutually coexists in our part as well so we must be deeply deeply aware of that more often than not we tend to overlook that we always say aristotle wrote poetics he spoke or wrote on the various form of tragedy drama poetry ideal poetry and so on and so forth but we often overlook the fact that when the west presents a single poetics from aristotle in the eastern aesthetics from india we have two poetics we have two poetics can anybody point out what are the poetics from india functionally that is well with east what i meant yukta ji is that when we speak about western tradition there was also a parallel eastern tradition that mutually coexisted yes so the one poetics that india had was natya shastra by bharata muni another one was kavya meemamsa kavya meemamsa meemamsa means politics or science and uh, kavya means poetry so what is poetics by aristotle science of poetry s c i e n c e like shastra kavya shastra so kavya meemamsa exactly does the same in india so we have two two, two poetics one defining how dance should be the other one defining how poetry should be and we say aristotle and we look at aristotle like this because of ignorance we don't know what's happening or we we don't know the sort of legacy that we carry on our back okay so i'm not taking you to the indian aesthetic part because that's not required here but i'm simply taking you to the uh, greco roman part and we'll quickly discuss aristotle and uh, um, plato okay yukta ji were you trying to ask something uh, yes sir sir uh, yeah. you distinct the west into greek roman and latin what about the mm -hmm. east for us we discuss indian aesthetics there are other in eastern aesthetics as well but then we are if if at all we want to delve deep into eastern indian ancient eastern criticism we look at indian aesthetics oh, okay okay thank you for asking that question i'll spend another 2 minutes of digression on that more often than not when you listen to lectures and depend on textbooks only they make you in a certain way conditioned you don't think beyond what is being said so that was a good question actually yukta because the point i'm trying to make is when we study literary criticism and theory in whichever university in india when you study this paper if you if you go and look at any of the books which are referred you would see that the, the bifurcation is made between eastern and western literary schools and under the western greco roman latin comes in and latin is seldom discussed and when it comes to eastern aesthetics only indian school is discussed theory of rasadwani and so on and so forth 
okay it is it is seen as art nanda kumar it's not literature per se but art in that case drama is not purely literature drama was poetry initially but drama is discussed right so it's more of art and art being considered to be universal and the loss of any form of art being mutually applicable to each other okay uh, let's not digress so the point i'm trying to say is or trying to emphasize is even in most of our textbooks the discussion to ancient ancient eastern criticism is pertinent to indian ancient forms it does not take away any other forms that exist maybe it's just that being indians we don't need to be aware of anything else there could be chinese literary criticism japanese literary criticism or say for instance arabian literary criticism but probably we don't dwell too deep into those things if you look at those videos that i had shared yesterday in literary uh, in in drama for that sake from crash course theater you would see that they have covered all these things generally when we discuss drama we speak about greek theater and then we speak about british theater and if at all we discuss we discuss uh, theater from ireland and uh, uh, maybe indian theater we do not discuss japanese or chinese or arabian theaters uh, in our class our literature classes even if suppose there are translations so why maybe because we don't want to put our hands into a lot of cups that could be a reason i don't have a proper answer. so when i when i try to give you certain directions don't get bogged down by that be aware that there are other things as well but then maybe i won't be able to mention all those things i'm just sticking to what is there in your blocks and what is there for you to study okay so talking about yeah this apparent again i can give you one more uh, ideal um, okay i'll keep it for later I'll, I'll i'll give you an idea of how english literary criticism i'll come to that a little while later okay so let me just quickly move on to these beginning inceptional parts all right so before discussing plato and aristotle it is important for you to understand the fourfold approach towards theory again this is a classical approach i had also asked you yesterday about the difference between the words classical and classic what is the difference between classical and classic because most of the students miss you know misunderstand one word for the other and lose marks yes gargi ji go on. yes sir Uh, classic and classical are often used interchangeably, uh, but there is a dis distinction. Classic generally refers to something what's regarded as an exemplary and enduring example of its kind, whether it's literature, art, or any other field. Classical usually relates um, uh, to the ancient Greek and Roman periods, or something that uh, ad uh, adheres to traditional forms and styles. Okay, thank you, thank you, Gargi ji. Again, look at that definition. Probably that's a textbook definition that she was reading, and look at how that says classical refers to Greece and Roman traditions. Why can't classical be related to Indian tradition? It is. It actually is. You can talk about Kalidasa as a classical Indian writer. See, so this is how textbooks may sometimes misguide us. Okay, so thank you, Gargi ji. But that's that's the answer I was looking forward to. A classic, a literary classic, is a touchstone stuff. Let's say we look at Hamlet and say it is a classic, or we look at Tom Jones and say it's a classic. It is an exemplary work. It is a best masterpiece sort of a work. We call that a classic. Classical means ancient. Classical means something that is long back, like Greco-Roman or ancient Indian tradition, and so on. So we are talking about classical literary theory for the time being. So we are not talking about classic, but classical. Yeah. So uh, while talking about the classical part, while we talk about the ancient part, the four, sorry, the four-fold approach to literary theory is something that you must be aware of. Your blocks do not uh, detail this as much as it should have. and that's why i'm taking that extra effort to give you a brief intro to this and we'll quickly rush through plato and aristotle so the four fold approach to literary theory there are four types mimetic 
pragmatic expressive and objective so if you want to take notes you may you may take lecture notes if you feel like or you may also simply listen and feel free to forget i am trying to explain this please, because this will be uh, so please repeat the four points that's there that's there in the chat box don't worry i am i'm sharing that in the chat box as well so be aware of these four distinctions because uh, especially mimetic theory is something that comes as a debate between plato and aristotle so what is mimetic theory it is interested in the relationship between a literary work and the universe again before that there are four things i want okay i forgot that okay so what is poetry is it a set of lies or is it a higher kind of truth so there are four questions that we need to address and these questions would keep coming back to us when we read literary criticism across the ages does poetry as mode of fiction draws as closer to or further away from truth is poetry truth or is poetry far removed from truth second is the poet a divine inspired genius or a craftsman because initially there was this belief that there is inborn genius and there is a divine blessing if you have to be a poet so is poet a divine genius or a craftsman third does poetry and poet serve a useful function to society are they leading the society or in platonic terms uh, are they misleading the society fourth is a poem a self enclosed artifact whose meaning is eternal and transcendent or the product of various social forces well this is a long going debate even when you come to roland barth who makes a theory you could see this confusion the struggle is the text self enclosed you can see that with new critics you can see that with barth the reader right so is it self enclosed or is that the product of various social forces marxism feminism all points out to the latter so this debate has been long existent so the mimetic theory is interested in the relationship between a literary work and the universe it sees poem as an imitation of the external world be it nature or supernature it believes that the best poem comes closer in approximating and even capturing the higher reality that it seeks to imitate it debates whether the work brings closer or leads away from truth it is concerned with the ultimate meaning and essence of poetry i hope this is simple whether the poetry should be imitative whether it should represent and be truthful in its portrayal and what the society can take from it the pragmatic theory is interested in the relation between the poem and its audience or the reader if you want to call it a reader it indulges in the estimation of the social didactic function of poetry it believes that the function of poetry is to teach and to please the pragmaticians they believe that the role of poetry is to teach and to delight or to please it establishes aesthetic rules for judging one the skill of the poet and two its impact on its audience i hope that's clear it believes that the function of poetry is to teach and to please and establishes aesthetic rules for judging the skill of the poet and its impact on the reader then there are expressive theories which are interested in the relationship between the poem and the poet it believes that the poetry is the reflection of the internal rather than the external reality poetry has a personal as opposed to social function it also believes that poetry has a prophetic rather than didactic function the question of what is a poem is almost synonymous with the question who is a poet so the expressive theorists look at who the poet is as much as what the poem is all about last but not the least we have the objective theories which is interested in the relationship between the poem and itself 
it focuses on the internal relationship within the poem poetry needless to say is a self contained self referential artifact that should be studied in isolation to external realities authorial biography and historical events the best example of an objective theory is new criticism close reading for that sake so a poem is a microcosm that runs in accordance with its own observable laws according to the objective theoreticians so please Excuse read me. the objective one yeah i'll do yes param ji you are about to ask something uh, what is the first uh, approach there are four one, four that i told you mimetic pragmatic ah, mimetic okay okay expressive okay. and objective okay okay mimetic i did, i miss yeah that's okay. okay not a problem yeah um so yukta ji you want me to repeat what objective is yes sir yeah objective sees the text or the poem as a self contained self referential artifact uh new criticism is a typical example like it looks at the close reading of a text and it doesn't look for anything beyond the text it looks at what is written and what is evident it does not look at the sociological background or the the the, the reason why the poet wrote the poem or the uh, historical background and other elements they are they are completely uh, overlooked by uh, the objective critics am i clear yes so now let's quickly move on to the greek literary tradition and as we talk about the greek literary tradition the first name that comes to our mind is that of plato plato and aristotle are two names that's even otherwise known to you because you have learned mathematics and geometry in schools so plato was the disciple of socrates a high philosopher of those times and uh, plato has there are three works of plato that are known to us the most popular among that is which work is it that you know about or know as written by plato republic republic precisely there is republic then there is another one called dialogues and then there is another one called phaedrus these are three major works and there is eon as well that we generally discuss while discussing plato again there is one thing i told you yesterday that you need to keep in mind because we are talking about let's say uh, 427 to 348 bc or back that time uh, it's been a long time so over this time we have lost most of these works due to famine flood fire war and so many reasons so none of the authentic versions are available what is there is a few pages remaining here and there or translated versions from translated versions i'll give you a classic example before coming to plato let me give you a, a classic example of aristotle you have all heard of his work called poetics right poetics or the science of poetry was written by aristotle approximately during let's say 330 or 40 bc that's when he wrote poetics the problem with reading and analyzing poetics as a student of literature is that first of all there is no poetics that is available to us in its full form the poetics that we are depending on is not the poetics that aristotle wrote i can see that you are getting confused even though i cannot see any of you uh, i am sure that you are getting confused let me make it simpler what you are trying to read as poetics by that i mean the summary in your blogs or the summaries in wikipedia or spark notes or e notes or whatever or even if you go buy a book titled poetics from bookstores what you are reading 
this is not what exactly aristotle has written rather it is a translated version of course mind you it's in english uh, aristotle wrote in greek so it is a translated version but it is not a translated version from greek to english rather what is available to us in its rawest form is uh, an arabic version of an arabic version of poetics from 8th century ad you guessed it right 8th century ad arabic version that is arabic translation of probably aristotle's poetics from greek to arabic we are not sure but that arabic version is depended by most of the translators english translators of poetics and it is that arabic translation that has been uh, converted into english a normal glance through your study materials or any of your um, sources would tell you that there are 26 chapters in poetics and people divide it into two one is discussion on what an ideal poetry should be and second is aristotle's discussions or theories on or formulations on uh, tragedy what gets lost in between is comedy so as per the available sources aristotle has not written in his poetics about comedy which is not true which is not true because we don't have evidence to believe both both means aristotle has written on comedy or aristotle has not written on comedy several lot of pages have been lost across the times i'll come to that discussion a little while later let me just begin with plato so talking about plato these are a few works that we recognize as written by plato plato was again not a literary person but as a statesman he had his own oratory skills which he exercised and back then greek society was a very rigid moral society again let me take 5 minutes of digression talking to you about evolution of drama because which is very important to discuss any of these theoreticians and their concepts so let me talk about the origins of drama okay so the origins of drama where did drama originate is a question that again leads you to the same place greece so that's not the question that i'm going to throw at you rather i would ask you how did drama originate as an art form in greece or what necessitated the performance of plays in greece ancient greece that is anybody so started as a religious rites yeah can uh, can you just elaborate a little bit on that so they used to worship dionysus and uh, from there like uh, it started and then it traveled to teach and the to teach uh, and bring together i mean uh, any really um so that religion acts as a binding force and here also when people is to yeah please please go on. i'll take them it's it's really interesting yes so i don't have much to share well that's okay that's totally okay so i'll take what she said so in ancient greece drama originated as a tributary form that paid reverence to their god whose name is dionysus okay or dionysus whichever way you want to call him so in order to pay tribute to dionysus every year there was a theater festival organized at the acropolis so people from various parts of greece assembled in the acropolis and they were supposed to perform four plays the division was three tragedies and one comedy so why is one superior to other is a different debate altogether but then three tragedies and a comedy so playwrights came from different parts and they performed plays and back then stories were quite limited so they had very few legends to bank on and sometimes competition would be held on the same story presented in different ways by different playwrights for instance the story of helen of troy or the story of the myth of oedipus 
or electra complex or antigone story this was simultaneously played by every playwright uh, with their own uh, use of devices let me go back to the initial point in greece in ancient greece drama originated as a religious art form another word that we can use or supplement for that is drama originated as a ritualistic art form so we could say we could use the word ritualistic drama or ritualistic theater again you may not be as enlightened as i am and you may be wondering why should this need this sort of an explanation what's what's the problem with ritualistic drama so ritualistic drama is something we often tend to overlook we again think about ancient greece and we say okay ritualistic drama come to england in queen elizabeth's time 16th century we speak about the rise of theater we speak about christopher marlowe william shakespeare ben jonson and so on what existed just before that we have morality miracle plays which are also partly ritualistic in nature forget that come to india i'm sure i have a north indian audience but there are malayali audiences as well i'm transacting from kalur rc kochin so some of you may be thinking why am i not using malayalam i'm using hindi also because there are quite a lot of hindi learners here but this time let me use a little bit of malayalam for the malayalis out there what is the malayalam of ritualistic drama what is the malayalam of ritualistic drama anybody out there malayalis we have a proper name for this no 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 I'm, this this question is for those who are from kerala that is i understand sir could you please kerala as well could you please repeat the question the question is what what yeah what is the exact malayalam word for the for the for the english word ritualistic theater yes kathakali is one of the ritualistic art forms but what is the malayalam term for that it's not ajaram there is another word just go to the next what follows ajaram rafna not madam no no don't go to religion that's not the stuff here if there is an ajaram that ajaram becomes a dash what the what is the word for practice if ajaram is a is a practice, ajaram is not actually a practice but anishtanam anishtan spot on any and so in malayalam we have something called anushtana kalagan right we have teyam tira padayani mudiyet and also all those stuffs this is exactly what happened in ancient greece the moment we say theater originated as a ritualistic art form in greece now come back and connect these two things kannalia that's why i said literary criticism is so interesting we often overlook this because our textbooks do not take us there if we use our brain and if we try to make these analogies it really becomes exciting we speak about the inception of theater in greece and we say it is ritualistic we have much exemplary examples in our own states take the case of mudiyet or teyam or padayani forget kadagali for a while right so imagine the sort of impact that these anushtana kalagal has in our day to day life and the cultural ethos that we dwell in and now go back to greece in order to please dionysius who was at once the god who had two superpowers one of agrarian produce the second one of human reproduction each so every society needs these two things right they want to be you know not starving and they want to have plenty of populace so in that context yeah i am coming to that priyam mukherjee it was considered the best form of literature but i'll come to that so uh, in that context ancient greek theater began as a ritualistic art form it began as a ritualistic art form and uh, it was to please dionysius ancient greek society was highly moralistic in nature 
and it was split between quite a lot of wars. Peloponnesian War lasted for 3,000 years, I suppose, so, or 1,000 years. So it, there was a streak of wars going on. In between that, there was all these things happening. And it was a highly moral society. Hence, there is the statement that Greek, the Greek society was highly uh, moralistic and tragedy was considered superior to comedy. Comedy was seen as an inferior art. Comedy did not produce anything except laughter. And nobody sees laughter as a serious endeavor. Tragedy on the opposite, opposite produces something called catharsis, an emotional purgation of feelings that Aristotle stood for. So that's why certain people speak about the superiority or supremacy of tragedy. It needn't be true. There could be exceptions as well. Uh, as I told you, more often than not, these discussions on tragedy emerges also because what is left and what we have access to are those of tragedy. It doesn't nullify the possibility of the existence of comedy and its relevance. Please always keep that in mind because we have not seen that. And as long as we have not seen that, how can we understand that? How can we claim that authentically? I was about to speak about Plato, but then because you are asking this question, uh, let me give you one more example, which is digressive for the time being. Uh, but then because you are con getting confused, let me give you one more example. As I told you, not the entire poetics written by Aristotle is available to us. Most of them have been lost. There could be a scenario where, let's say next year, an archaeology department team excavates and discovers an entire book by Aristotle on poetics where he celebrates comedy. We never know. It could be, you know, deep inside some recesses of uh, waters, probably. So that being the case, there are quite a lot of things being said. Let me give you one interesting digressive story. There is this popular environmental activist come writer whose name is Umberto Eco. He passed away recently. You may have heard of Umberto Eco. He has written a work called The Name of the Rose. It's a detective fiction. You may wonder why am I talking about a detective fiction in a class as serious as that of literary criticism. It has nothing to do with theory. It has nothing serious in it. It's just like a Sherlock Holmes story or a James Bond story for that sake or Agatha Christie's novels for that sake. So Umberto Eco has a, has a crime fiction, a detective fiction titled The Name of the Rose. So what happens in that, in that work is two detectives go in search of a murder mystery. As part of their research, they go deep into various places and they even go into the papal chamber. Papal, by papal, I mean the Pope, the Holy Pope from Rome. So they go to the Pope's chamber in Rome and they discover that there is an underground passage inside the papal chamber. So they unlock it and they go into the underground chamber. What exists in the underground chamber of Pope? Mind you, this is fiction. Don't get me wrong. Don't think really Pope has an underground chamber and this is what exists there. This is just fiction for fiction's sake. Though it has a huge politics in it. So under that papal chamber, what these detectives discover is a library. A library. Any guesses as to what? All books are there inside that library. What books constitutes that library of uh, the underground chamber of, uh, of the papal chamber? Greek classics. Okay. Deeper, deeper, deeper. Try. It's a satirical observation, a deeply startling political observation by Umberto Eco. Come on, give it a try. There are no correct answers here. All right, let's not waste time. History, ancient history. 
Okay, okay. So let me just give you the answer. Doesn't matter. So under that papal chamber in the library that is arranged, all those books which are banished, which are blasphemous, which are controversial, which have been deemed to be lost, are well preserved. You get me? All those books which are blasphemous, which are banned, which are considered to be illegal or controversial can be found inside that underground chamber. Amongst those books or that collection, there also is an entire book on comedy written by Aristotle. Now that's a surprise, right? The entire book on comedy written by Aristotle as part of politics is available in that underground chamber of the Pope from Rome. This is fic fictional, okay? This is not true. But what made Umberto Eco write that? Why amongst the many books he takes the name of comedy by Aristotle? The Pope has not pressured these books underground because of the love for it. But all these books that he has pressured would be danger to what he represents. The religion, the belief systems. Why? Why? Because fear is the beginning of religious beliefs or faith. Right? What is all the gods and demigods say fear not have faith in me or have faith in the holy father he will not let you down so what kills fear and thereby kills faith is called comedy the moment you laugh at something or someone or the moment you are happy you are never going to call Hiram. right it's when your exams come and you are scared and when the deadlines emerge and you haven't completed the assignments you call upon all the gods, gods that exist in, the, in this universe. So it is fear that evokes faith. If there is comedy and if there is laughter, Umberto Eco sarcastically tells us that the entire office of the, of the Pope and his followers, or for that sake any religious bodies, would get closed. So just a digressive example so that you get what I was trying to say. So most of these works, these ancient works that we come across, they're not completely available to us. So we try to deal with it and try to decipher whatever is available to us. So there could be certain handicaps here and there. Okay, so these are three works that I spoke to you about. And uh, back then, during Plato's time, we are talking about Plato, so let me just come back there. So during Plato's time, the glory of Athenian art and literature was kind of declining. I spoke to you about the theater festival and uh, the plays being play, uh, performed, the three tragedy, one comedy, division and so on. There are few, there are only very few playwrights that we are familiar with. Again, because only that much have we got. There could be other playwrights, but we don't know about them. So the playwrights that we are available that we are aware of are Aesiclus, Sophocles, Euripides, and Aristophanes. The first three are tragic playwrights. The last is a comedian. Yes, all of them had three tragedy and a comedy system followed, but then the top three mastered or excelled in tragedies, and Aristophanes excelled in comedies. No, that's, you need not be ap uh, apologetic about that. Ritualistic can be religious as well, but they are not absolutely religious in every case. That's why I gave you quite a lot of examples. The moment I say Teyam or Tira or Mudiyate or take the case of Muttapan, which religion does Muttapan belong to? Right? So it need not always be, that's why I use the word Anushtanam. Anushtanam need not always be a religious practice. It could be a cultural practice. It could be a societal exercise. It could be an exercise that's been handled from one generation to another. 
So it's quite deep and complex. I don't want to confuse you. For the time being, be aware of this minimalistic thing. Okay. So back then, this uh, glory of Greece was waning, and this larger debate was being held between theater and art, or the poet and art. So yeah, I, what I was trying to tell you is when theater emerged as a ritualistic art form, theater or drama was not prosaic in nature. Drama was written in verse, V E R S E. It is poetry. In in our language, we say slogans. We have slogans in our uh, kandas, Bhagavadam, Mahabharatam. We have the slogans that we recite. So similarly, the plays consisted of uh, verses rather than. What do you call as prose? Prose. Yeah, prose. So I just took a breather. Don't worry. I was not forgetting that. It's just, I'm going through a terrible uh, sinusitis come to take. So I was under painkillers yesterday and so today. So when the clock strikes past six o'clock, the pain starts. So sometimes I have to take deep waters and breaks. Okay. So I was trying to tell you that it was written in verse. So it was more of utterances. Theater back then. The reason why I'm talking to you about theater is when we discuss Plato and Aristotle and their concepts, this overview is very much significant. So when we speak about Greek theater, it is not the theater that we are familiar with these days. There was no drop curtains. There was no movable sceneries. There was no proper costumes. There was not even movement. In Greek theater, they had masks. We have to read catharsis again and wonder how catharsis is enacted by uh, an actor with a mask and heavy costumes. So back in Greek times, the actor had a heavy costume and a mask. So imagine if I am crying with a mask on, how far can I impact you with my cry? It's a question. So nonetheless, back then, all these things were part of the stagecraft. And in the stage, there were two characters who came and stood and they recited to each other. I hope you understand what I mean. There is one character who comes and says, what is going on in Athens, darling? Did the war stop? And then the other person would start his recitation. He'll be like, no, 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 no. Hercules is battling all the demons and we can't say who will win tomorrow. And then they'll go on exchanging it in this manner. So such recitals is what made drama back then. More often than not, we have this another misconception that it is about exchange of dialogues and action. And when we speak about war, it happens a clash and bloodshed. In Greek theater, war never happened on stage. They happened backstage and they were reported. No bloodshed was appreciable or acceptable to a highly moral Greek society. So on stage, no such scenes were depicted. Two or three characters came on stage, they stood still and they recited. Recited is a better word. They recited their lines. Now connected to the term that I used, ritualistic drama. In Malayalam, we say Parayanam. Right? We have Parayanam at our residences. Same, same. So they are reciting the dialogues. The poetry was what constituted the lines in drama. Prose was unknown to them. Okay, So it was in that era that Plato existed. Yes, time, place and action, Priyam Mukherjee. I'm glad you know that. We'll discuss that when we come to Aristotle. I don't think uh, we'll have time to discuss Aristotle today because there's quite a lot of things to be discussed. It will take an hour. So maybe I'll deal with Plato today and uh, we'll come back tomorrow and discuss Aristotle in detail. So three unities are something that Aristotle... Okay. okay. Yeah. yeah, so I'll discuss Aristotle tomorrow. Three unities are, are propounded by Aristotle and I'll tell you why. Uh, Arpitaji, the problem is, I had told this yesterday itself, uh, when the COVID pandemic broke out, it was the regional center and sometimes we as academic counselors started these Google meetings. 
so we would be able to accommodate anybody who joins late i appreciate and i understand that people work and they come late and they have domestic chores to take care of so i wouldn't mind that but over the last 2 10 years the study center has been in charge of this uh, telecasts so they have already mentioned that because they have a lot of things to take care of it's not only english class simultaneously they are Uh, there are a lot of other classes happening, and they have to record that and all. So they would let you in only between five thirty and five forty-five. And again, five forty or forty-five is not a guarantee. Five thirty though is a guarantee. Again, I am on record, and I shouldn't be saying this professionally. That is, but in the last leg session also, those who attended that, I have uh, expressed my discontent in this. Back then, when you when I used to host the sessions, my classes began at five twenty twenty-five. because i am quite particular about playing some song relaxing your mood allowing that time for late comers to come in and then start my sessions but the problem that i encounter with the study center and even if i keep complaining they are not paying heed to me or anyone else so what you you would have noticed that today i was trying to get in from 525 onwards when did the link open it opened at 533 the recording started at 5:35 so that is unprofessionalism from my observation but i am fed up saying this to the study center people they don't pay heed and because ignore is a national open university and nobody probably gives too much attention into what's going on there or it's quite difficult to correct these people unfortunately we have to bear with this i understand arpita ji that people who are waiting uh, i understand their concerns but i don't have any privilege to let them in. i have been asking them to make me a co-host at least but then there is nothing that i can do about this i'm so sorry so please let them know that if they want to attend the class log in at 535 sorry 53035 530, so that they can listen to my class so once you log in even if you exit then you can easily come back but unless you don't log in then it's difficult because that will be showing in their window i can't see that and they would be minding some other businesses and they may not be bothered about who is getting in and who is not these are certain ethical parameters that i keep talking about but in vain because this is a lonely band i can keep on grumbling about this you can keep on grumbling about this but there is no proper proper grievance redressal system as far as taking strict action against these sort of people unfortunately i must say i am as enraged as you are well punctuality i i agree but then we cannot talk about punctuality at every stage there's a difference between equality and equity like for people who work they can't join at 5:30 i understand their concern it's not a problem it's not a fault they may sometimes reach back home only at 6:30 we can't blame them come on we have to be accommodating as a teacher i have to accommodate all your wishes i can't say come to my class only at 5:30 and i'll let you only in that's dictatorial nature i speak to you about democracy in most of my classes and if i myself show an example of a dictator then what's the point in it i cannot be autocratic i understand i respect those who come at 5:30 well and good because you would be able to understand what i say from 5:30 there's a continuity i take that point but igno is a place where i can't be adamant of that i understand the sort of diverse learner clientele that we have so it becomes problematic all right so let me let me just quickly carry on with plato and uh, let me play this video for you there are two or three major debates that we have to be aware of regarding plato one is his concept of mimesis and artists which is later understood by aristotle and also this major concept of plato's cave so i'll begin with the cave imagery and then quickly move on to the debate and uh, we'll have the quiz day and quit and come back tomorrow for aristotle Okay. So back then, there is this debate between original and copy, or reality and imitation. So let's say ideas are the ultimate reality. So the idea of everything is the original. The thing itself then is a copy. This is called two-tiered metaphysics, or two-tiered me metaphysics. I'm sorry. 
So the copy, needless to say, according to the Greeks, often falls short of the original. Whatever you try to imitate can never equate the origin. Art reproduces or imitates or means physical reality. Art tries to imitate what is existent. So mimesis happens. It was Plato who coins the term mimesis. Though most often people attribute it to Aristotle because he defends it. But it was Plato who coins the term mimesis and he says that images of art are copies of copies. I know it's slightly getting confusing to you. So let me give you a very simple example. Forget art, forget literature. Let's, let's speak about a construction. A chair. Chair, chair as in kursi, kasera. A chair firstly exists as an idea, an abstract terminology. Secondly, as an object of craftsmanship. And thirdly, as an object of representation in art. Hence, Plato says that mimesis is thrice removed from reality. The concept, the art and what is there in the art. Again, he says that when rightly pursued, art brings good, but very few people use it well. So Plato, as a responsible citizen, feels it is necessary for him to draw down good and you know the, 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 the ideal things that a writer is supposed to do. The poets are immoral, so they have to perform in certain ways so as to serve the uh, society that they are part of. So just like Aristotle, he also speaks about poetry and drama. He, he uh, speaks about poetic inspiration to be divine without the uh, in rational involvement of the poet. He, uh, that's why he says that poetry cannot be relied upon. Right? Poet is spontaneous about his feelings and spontaneity cannot be divine and it cannot be relied upon. Anything that is impulsive appeals to baser emotions than higher intellect. I hope you understand what baser emotions means. Baser means faltu ke thoughts or silly thoughts. Base, gross, impulsive, desirous emotions. So he claims that uh, baser emotions encourages passions and let them rule. So that is not good for a society. Again, I am not leaving this right here. This is contested by Aristotle, to which I shall come back tomorrow. But also draw an analogy between William Wordsworth. Centuries later, he says poetry is a spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. Across the ages, this debate doesn't end. But then nobody asks Wordsworth about the moral function because society is already morally corrupt by then. Thanks to industrialization. Yeah, so okay. So in the Greek era, that was not the case. So morality was a principal thing. And uh, uh, Plato thinks that poetry should instruct. It should mold character and promote the interests of the state. See, this doesn't it, this may sound, this may seem apparently simpler to you. But across the generations, people have come back and debated over this. Repeated the same facts with different terminologies. It's really interesting if you look at it diachronically. The problem is we look at it synchronically. Okay, so let me just read this out again. This is quite exciting. Just read this out again. Poetry should mold character, M-O-U-L-D, mold, form character, and promote the interest of the state. Now come to the last part. Poetry should cater to the interest of the state. I am that what we call as dictatorial in a democratic world. There are still people who condemn censorship. There are people who believe that the state is taking away privileges of individual freedom, freedom of speech, freedom of expression. And then you have Plato who says that anything that a poet writes should cater to uh, the interests of the state. Censorship? Well, I leave it to you. But then I'm just drawing these analogies to make this exciting. I hope you are able to understand. Right? Back then, 
the society was not as developed they had very few tales to rely upon and they were highly moral in their grounds they were not as civilized as we claim to be today and of course again these are parallels even though we claim to be civilized we are in a post modern ny where we are confused we don't know which way to go we we have a problem of plenty are we enlightened from the clutches of religion and other superstitious stuff or are we supposed are we not free by leaving them aside it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a personal question that all of us need to address so he also speaks about drama and claims that it also arouses baser instincts by offering cheap pleasure to the masses this leads to bad taste and laxity in discipline in personation which every actor does Uh, according to plato impersonation represses individuality and enfeebles character tragic and comic pleasure arise from excesses and weaknesses there is this popular misconception right if somebody is somebody does not cry and he is bold he is good the same thing the same bakwas uh, plato says that tragedy and comedy and its pleasure arises from excesses and weaknesses which is not ideal for a state for a mechanism to function properly we need people who are not minding their emotions who are cruel who are bold right bakwas in 2023 after the covid most of the people have started looking back at the world and probably mindfulness has become a good word everybody knows what a depression means everybody know how much self care should matter and now everybody have started realizing that we have to follow our heart if you like traveling travel you may die tomorrow there could be another virus outbreak from china and we'll be dead the next day maybe next hour next minute we can't be sure we can't be predict in such a world we have to follow the passion of the heart and art yeah the heart and the art those are the two escape routes for us if you want to dance dance if you want to sing sing if you want to learn learn there is no age limit there is no time frame there is nothing that should stop us the only clause is as long as we are alive okay let me not get philosophical let me get back to the stuff okay so plato says that uh it is from our weaknesses that are being exploited by um poetry and drama in particular and that's why he believes that because these people are gross uh, poets must be abandoned from the state okay so we were speaking about art being thrice removed from reality besides on a practical note poetry appeals to the weaker inferior side of our psyche like i pointed out so psyche denotes both mind and soul in greek and is divided into two rational and emotional we all have two types of psyche within us rational and emotional the fanciful poetry appeals to the illogical side of our mind and soul i hope that's quite clear to you even in this era we can easily relate to this people believe that art corrupts human beings because we cannot be disciplined and for a state and a structure to function this whole thing is required the fanciful poetry appeals to the illogical side of our mind and soul as i told you and as a third reason plato believes that poetry is a kind of contagion he says that in i am that uh, poetry is a kind of contagious thing so once you get addicted to it it spreads to it's like a virus he goes on to accuse that poetry is a form of madness a possession by possession i'm not saying what we hold to us the other possession like a ghostly possession baada gerga nakka nammal malayalathi parayum so he accuses that poetry is possession a form of possession it is a mad enraging thing which should be discouraged as he concludes again this is not a monotonous statement any other new discoveries could nullify this but as he ends uh, his statements in the republic plato agrees to let the poets back into the republic if anyone could prove that poetry has a useful function in society 
I hope that's clear. If anyone can prove that poetry has a useful function in the society, I shall take back whatever I said. All these are contested by Aristotle in poetics, which we shall discuss tomorrow. But because, because I'm trying to make sense and trying to give you relatable analogies, let me give you an interesting example. If you have watched the movie Mohabate, starring Amitabh Bachchan, Shah Rukh Khan, Jimmy Shergill, and so many other people, for me, Plato is Amitabh Bachchan. I forgot the three words, Parampara, Pratishtha, and something, some other crap. Amitabh Bachchan speaks about those three things. That's what his college or his institution is all about. Anushtan, Pradeep, uh, whatever, whatever crap it is. Yeah. So Shah Rukh Khan tries to bring all these things down. Again, Shah Rukh Khan is a musician. He, he, he plays violin. Yeah, Anushasa, whatever crap. I, I, I don't know, maybe because I took art or maybe I didn't go back to science after my 10th grade. I have a strong um, dislike towards all these sort of disciplining terminologies. So yeah, uh, Shah Rukh Khan tries to bring indiscipline into an institution which is known for its disciplining processes. So uh, Amitabh Bachchan kind of resonates to uh, Aristotle's views. Or if you have watched the movie Three Idiots, the principal character played by Bauman Irani in Hindi and Satyaraj in Tamil would uh, replicate the same. These people again are types. You can draw them in a single line. They hold the same belief systems. They are judgmental, they are prejudiced, they are biased and they are hypocritical because they expect the others to be not them. And they say that they are <laughs> what are they are not right. So that's highly paradoxical to me. So Plato says this, Plato says that poetry is a form of possession. You go to any of these stereotypical grandparents or parents who would say that if you go to movies, bacha bigger jayega. The same across generations, across genres, whatever is the latest genre that is trending, that is making people happy and excited, the family, the society would tell you, don't go that way. That will corrupt you. That will ruin you. That will damage you. Your reputation as well as the familial reputation. And there is the stock dialogue. If you can show an example of anybody who has done good in this regard, I'll take my words back. And if at all we try to argue with a few names, they'll say these are only few names. In, uh, just as a part of digression, I'd like to give you another, another example. The Malayalis would know. I did my post-graduation in a college called Maharaja's Government College Arnaku. It's quite popular because it's a government college. It's one of the best in the state. And uh, it, is a, it is a temple of arts. Even though we call that a college, it's more of uh, a miniature of a society. So when people go to Maharajas, people go to Maharajas because classes seldom happen. You can engage in whatever you like. You can go behind drama, arts. You can go for movies. And Maharajas is surrounded by every uh, ideal place. You have a lot of theatres around Maharajas. There are, there are a couple of parks opposite Maharajas. There is a hospital, a government hospital near Maharajas. Um, there are almost everything that you want to go to. Except the classroom. Classroom is also there in Maharajas. But classrooms are less attractive. So... People go to Maharajas so that they can bunk uh, classes. Yes, politics is also there. But politics is there in the society as well. That's why I said it's a miniature of society. So in Maharajas, people go not to study, but to explore and, and enjoy life. But there also you will have teachers who are st stereotypical. So I had one teacher of mine who used to say the same thing that, you know, Maharajas is a place where uh, you will have all these diversions. Don't fall trap of that. Trap for, trap for that. Uh, try to study. If you study, you will pass. If you fail, nobody is going to come with you. Then, of course, there were parallel voices. Students would definitely speak back. Maharaj is not a place where we would shut up just because a teacher is superior to us in terms of ranks. So there are students who would ask back saying, okay, so and so and so is there, uh, going behind films and getting good. And then that teacher would say, Mamuti, Ashikabu, etc. Or just a few names who have made a name out of movies. There are thousands of people whom I know who spoil their lives by going behind movies. Well, again, I am making references to not that teacher, but Plato. 
so we'll come across quite a lot of play to amma and mar in our life and i personally believe that we should just let them mind their business which they won't so we can just ignore them by minding our own business following our heart wherever it takes us if we fail that is the best learning experience that doesn't mean we should rethink this is not a competition this is not a race we are here to explore our life stay happy and do things that at least makes us feel better on that note the floor is open for questions tomorrow we'll discuss aristotle because of the want of time it will take a good 40 minutes and i didn't want to rush through aristotle so i hope i was able to give you a background on what classical literary criticism is and what to say the least what plato has done to begin with if there are any questions it's open if not let me see if i can play one more video for you because i spoke about comedy in greek theater yes just 5 minutes all right so i'll give you 5 minutes to think if you have any queries in the meanwhile sit back and relax and watch this amazing video because the moment we speak about greek theater people generally speak about greek tragedies comedies are in a way subdued or subjugated so this particular video addresses that issue and i'm sure this will be quite useful to you when you come back and address these theories at the annual athenian drama festival in 426 bc a comic play called the babylonians written by a young poet named aristophanes was awarded first prize but the play's depiction of athens conduct during the peloponnesian war was so controversial that afterwards a politician named cleon took aristophanes to court for slandering the people of athens in the presence of foreigners aristophanes struck back 2 years later with a play called the knights in it he openly mocked cleon ending with cleon's character working as a lowly sausage seller outside the city gates this style of satire was a consequence of the unrestricted democracy of 5th century athens and is now called old comedy aristophanes plays the world's earliest surviving comic dramas are stuffed full of parodies songs sexual jokes and surreal fantasy they often use wild situations like a hero flying to heaven on a dung beetle or a net cast over a house to keep the owner's father trapped inside in order to subvert audience expectations and they've shaped how comedy's been written and performed ever since the word comedy comes from the ancient greek komos revel and oid singing and it differed from its companion art form tragedy in many ways where ancient athenian tragedies dealt with the downfall of the high and mighty their comedies usually ended happily and where tragedy almost always borrowed stories from legend comedy addressed current events aristophanes comedies celebrated ordinary people and attacked the powerful his targets were arrogant politicians warmongering generals and self-important intellectuals exactly the people who sat in the front row of the theater where everyone could see their reactions as a result they were referred to as komodoumenoi those made fun of in comedy Aristophanes vicious and often obscene mockery held these leaders to account testing their commitment to the city one issue in particular inspired much of Aristophanes work the Peloponnesian war between Athens and Sparta in peace written in 421 BC a middle-aged Athenian frees the embodiment of peace from a cave where she'd been exiled by profiteering politicians Then in the aftermath of a crushing naval defeat for Athens in 411 BC Aristophanes wrote Lysistrata In this play the women of Athens grow sick of war and go on a sex strike until their husbands make peace Other plays use similarly fantastic scenarios to skewer topical situations such as in Clouds where Aristophanes mocked fashionable philosophical thinking The hero Strepsiades 
enrolls in Socrates' new philosophical school, where he learns how to prove that wrong is right and that a debt is not a debt. No matter how outlandish these plays get, the heroes always prevail in the end. Aristophanes also became the master of the parabasis, a comic technique where actors address the audience directly, often praising the playwright or making topical comments and jokes. For example, in Birds, the chorus takes the role of different birds and threatens the Athenian judges that if their play doesn't win first prize, they'll defecate on them as they walk around the city. <laughs> Perhaps the judges didn't appreciate the joke as the play came in second. By exploring new ideas and encouraging self-criticism in Athenian society, Aristophanes not only mocked his fellow citizens, but he shaped the nature of comedy itself. Hailed by some scholars as the father of comedy, his fingerprints are visible upon comic techniques everywhere, from slapstick to double acts, to impersonations, to political satire. Through the praise of free speech and the celebration of ordinary heroes, his plays made his audience think while they laughed. And his retort to Cleon in 425 BC still resonates today. I'm a comedian, so I'll speak about justice, no matter how hard it sounds to your ears. Did you know that TED-Ed has a student voice program All right, so before I take your questions, um, I had a question from Aditi Goyal as to what allegory is. Allegory, simply put, is any work which has its character's name, which is self-revelated. Let's say, for instance, there is a character in a novel or a short story or a play with the, uh, with the name um, Angry Young Man. And suppose that character is angry. And that becomes an allegorical one. My name is allegorical, isn't it? Anand. I spread happiness. Uh, a classic example that I can give you is there is this popular Puritan writer whose name is John Bunyan. John Bunyan has written a prose work called The Pilgrim's Progress. The Pilgrim's Progress. It is <clears throat> an allegorical work. The name of the protagonist is Christian and the, 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 the work is about his, his pilgrimage. So Christian is an embodiment of all the Christians across the world and the, 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 the journey of salvation that they are supposed to take. And in that work you have characters like Hope, H-O-P-E, uh, Mr. Wicked Heart and so on. So those names in itself are uh, types, they, they reflect what their character is. I hope I'm clear to you. Yes, sir. So, and sir, what is irony and melancholy? These terms also make me confused because I don't belong to arts background. Well, melancholy is more about a solitude, a, a, a sort of uh, despair that you have when you are by yourself. Irony is something I shall discuss later while discussing new criticism because irony and paradox are two key terms. So maybe I, it requires a bit more time. So I'll, I'll talk about that later. Uh, but there is nothing to be confused about. It's not that complicated to be honest. Well, transcendentalism is again in contrast to something called dark romanticism. So I would request you to read basics from the web about dark romanticism versus transcendentalism. Uh, in America, in the early part of 20th century, this was quite prevalent. So dark romanticists had a grim view of the world. They believed that Ye to baad mein jayega, whatever we do, we are not going to progress. This is going to be hell. We are born and we have to die and we are simply suffering. That sort of a grim view they had, a gothic view is what the dark romanticists had. Transcendentalists were comparatively idealistic. So dark romanticists believed that man does not have any role in his destination. Whatever we do, we are going to die. But transcendentalists were idealistic. They were optimistic. They believed that man can shape his or her destiny. Again, two names that comes to my mind is Ralph Waldo Emerson 
and uh, oh, you may just Google these people. They were highly optimistic in nature. They believed that human beings are self-capable of handling their own destiny and creating one if it's required. Even if I die. Hello, sir. Good evening, sir. Yes, Padmanabhan. Go on. Yeah. Good evening, sir. Sir, uh, like it is a very scholarly lecture, sir. I'm Thank eager, you. eager to listen you more. Thank you. But I'm very new to English. Actually, my English also not so good. Doesn't and, matter. Uh, and uh, I'm very eager, eagerly want to complete my uh, MEG from IGNO. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wish you the very best. As I told you, your language cannot be changed over a year or two, right? Uh, let's assume if you are 20 or 30 year old, uh, ha having accumulated whatever you have over 29 years, just because you have joined for MEG, you can't take a complete U-turn in two, two years. But what can be done is, this is actually a good first step. For all those who think that my English is not good, not mine, but yours. If you think your English is not good, half is done. Because you know where you stand. Now work on that, build on that. There is no rule that you should use only complicated words in exam. You use your simple language. You prepare for the exam using your simple language. Communication should happen. That's as simple as that. When somebody asks you about transcendentalism, you should write about transcendentalism. You shouldn't write about dark romanticism. Simple as that. So that doesn't take too much of an effect. The moment you know you're not good at something, you can definitely work on that within what you have. Just take the case of our mothers. I'm not glorifying them or stereotyping them. But my mother, for instance, she's no longer with us. But then when she was there, she knows how to run the family with, let's say, 20,000 rupees per month. She also knows how to run the family with 8,000 rupees a month. She knows how to put one tomato less and still make the kids be, and still make us feel delighted about it. So that is what you call resource management. And it is not rocket science. You can easily do that. Expressing yourself. Yeah, that's exactly what it matters. Expressing yourself is something that is really important. And I'd like to tell you once again that, again, I understand your ideal outcome is passing MEG and becoming teachers or whatever. But let me tell you, even if you fail, that's not the end of the world. You go and draw keep painting and you have become an established artist, it's still a great thing. You go out, you act and you become an accomplished actor or actress, it's still a great thing. At the worst case scenario, imagine you achieve nothing. You don't have a proper job, you don't get any salary, you don't get placed, you're simply living a rotten life. I would say it is still okay as long as you don't take a gun and put it on other people's heads. It's still a great thing. Live a life peacefully contained in your own circumstances. Do things that pacifies your soul and make no nuisance to anybody and grow on your own pace. Grow at your own pace. It, it, it will be different from one person to another. I told you already. Examples of works on dark romanticism, there are quite a lot of them. There is this popular poem by Edgar Allan Poe called Raven. Again, there is this popular short story by Nathaniel Hawthorne. The Birthmark. The Birthmark by Nathaniel Hawthorne. It's a short story, a four page long. If you Google it, you will get a four page short story. Excuse me. Yes, please. This uh, talking about uh, Plato. Yep. While Greece was all this full of all these uh, philosophers, poets, dramatists, everybody, but what happened to the other part of the Europe? Oh, how come that there is total silence from the there? Is, why nothing come from the? I mean, are you asking me why when we speak about ancient literature, we are talking only about Greece? Is that what you are trying to ask? Yes. Yes. Why there is okay. nothing from other part of Europe? Okay. Uh, again, let me clarify. This is what I did initially in today's class. It doesn't mean there is nothing. 
in the particular context where we are trying to assess criticism and literature we are focusing on certain models and why they are models as we explain we are trying to make it clear as well so for for our convenience the selections have been in certain ways again at an extended discussion we may debate and we may say that there are certain political uh, agendas behind this why sir again as i told you greek rome and latin are the three distinctions that i made when i began the lecture so why not maybe some other thing so there are several factors including political supremacy and again these are things that keeps art alive even though we acknowledge legends or geniuses individual talents it is the uh, it is the political circumstance which gives it mileage political and religious circumstances so it's a larger debate to be honest all right thank you well well priyam mukherjee <laughs> you are talking to me of about mg1 metaphysical poetry comes there i'm sure someone would definitely come and tell you what metaphysical poetry is but it's not john dryden it's john dun d o n n e all right doesn't matter okay <laughs> Dryden is an entirely different one. It's not metaphysical. Metaphysical poetry is known, or poets are known for their conceits. But I don't think I'll have time sufficient enough to explain these concepts. But metaphysical poetry is interesting. I'll I'll give you one reference. There is this essay titled "The Metaphysical Poets." Who wrote the essay? Yet. Any any any? Yeah, T. S. Eliot. So T. S. Eliot has written an essay titled "The Metaphysical Poets." during their time the metaphysical poets were actually not that popular they didn't enjoy that privilege but a few centuries after their existence t s eliot reread them and wrote an essay and ever since they gained currency or popularity so if you want to read a little bit on that i would suggest that essay to you all right so in that case let's wrap it for today i'll come back tomorrow and discuss aristotle with you so you can google whatever you want to under aristotle aristotle's concept of tragedy sir. and agnosis peripetia yes please uh i have a doubt yes sir uh, uh as i am not fluent in english and i am new to this language uh, i i have in done this as my core subject on so how is it how can i study this with i because i can't capture this as easy as it seems okay while taking classes or lectures i can follow with it or follow up with it how can i mm -hmm. well uh, again it's a larger discussion it calls for a larger discussion but then let me try to keep it as simple as possible as far as comprehension is concerned you you may not be an auditory learner sometimes so maybe listening to lectures could be difficult to you so you may depend on the reading materials that is available to you or if you think it is lectures that helps you more than books you can try to listen to it time and again maybe if you listen to me live yes there are certain words that i use you may not be able to understand so you can go back and look at the recordings uh, in the link that i shared yesterday from rc kochin my lectures on mg5 are available i have spoken the same things in different ways in different contexts so you can go back and have a look at that and uh, probably that will help that's my suggestion arati and listening to you okay. i don't think you have too much of a problem in speaking fluently you were really speaking fluently thank you sir yeah dr shamla uh, course in swayam swayam.org is a central government mooc portal so in swayam dr sir i searched Pandu, there but i did not find that that may be because okay. maybe it is not running in the current cycle they, they have cycles so probably the the next cycle is not open yet that could be the reason okay okay so maybe you will have to wait for that to be listed at some point of time Thank you, Nanda Kumar. That's a compliment that would keep me going for another week. Thank you so much, uh, Zafar. That's what I do. I had given some suggestions yesterday regarding the history of English books series, and uh, that could quite, especially Paul Popolowski's English literature in context. 
is a book that may come to your help. I've also given the EPG server, which you may also access. And you may also refer to the previous year question papers that could help. And listening to as many lectures as possible. Just like uh, Amir Khan says in Three Idiots. In that case, you have to change the college uniform, change college change. Here you just need to have links. Get as many links as possible. Go get into the classes. Anyway, camera is off. No, because there are 90 learners, nobody is going to make sure whether you are from IGNO or not. I know quite a lot of learners. I mean, I, I, I do guess that quite a lot of learners give these links to other learners who are not part of IGNO, who are doing, it, who are doing their post-graduation in some other colleges. And those learners come and attend my classes because they want to know about the topic. So as long as you have a curiosity, then you can find as many links as possible to keep you going. All right. So thank you so much, everyone.